Hi, I'm Sarah Petra, and I'm so happy to join you. Thank you, Keith, for having me today. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do so. Um, so, Sarah, as we've as I've mentioned to my class, is a is what is a humanitarian. And so the past 20 years, she has been traveling the globe, going all over the place to all these incredibly interesting spots, basically helping people as she goes. And so this is a really unique opportunity for you guys to meet somebody who has literally been doing the work. So often you will learn about things in school, especially in my class. And she has actually been on the forefront of a lot of these issues we've been talking about. So, um, so Sarah, how would, you, how would you describe your job? I tried to do it in a couple sentences. How would you describe what you do? So, yeah, thanks, Keith. It's so funny. So I just recently uh, came out with a book called Bring Rain, Helping Humanity in Crisis. And the truth is that uh, as a humanitarian, I've had several different types of careers in the last 20 years. I really started out by being one of those people who um, focuses on bringing relief directly to people in crisis. That means being kind of like a first responder and working with United Nations agencies and the Red Cross and putting together packages of aid for people in need. And then I really moved into a period where I became very involved in advocacy and uh, working on Capitol Hill with the US government and um, trying to bring the situation of people in crisis uh, to decision makers so that they could um, develop greater plans and strategies and offer more funding to uh, humanitarian emergencies. And then my work shifted again and focused more on working with the military and uh, trying to help um, operations in war zones be more responsive to the people on the ground and um, trying to mitigate violence against specific groups of people um, like children and child soldiers or women affected by sexual violence or uh, taken um, as hostages or uh, human trafficking and trying to address these broader countrywide problems um, by uh, advising the military about how to manage uh, population dynamics. So I think it's really great that you guys have been studying human geography um, because we all are individuals, but we all come from a particular place or a particular culture. And it's really important to understand where other people come from and how to understand uh, demographics of a population, specifically if you want to address a particular problem, whether that's a smaller problem at the community level or a bigger problem at a, a multilateral level where you're trying to get many countries to come together and solve a particular dilemma. Um, having a good understanding of the culture and the population dynamics um, can give you great insight into problem solving and into um, also um, trying to um, help people who, who are caught up in a bad situation, whether that's uh, related to climate change and natural disasters and uh, big storms, or whether that's related to human conflict and conflict uh, between armed groups or conflict even between communities that can escalate into a full on uh, war. So what you're studying can have huge implications um, depending on what kind of problem you're motivated to try to solve in your future work. That is, that is amazing. That is amazing. I'm, one of the questions that I often have adults talk about with my students, because it's either on the forefront of their minds or it's right behind the forefront of their minds, is how did you figure out what type of job you wanted to do? Like in my case, it was rather circular. When I met you, I was an international studies student and we were both at Georgetown University together. I already at that point was, was exploring that. And then I went into public relations for like seven years and did that. And then at the end of that, I was realizing I was good at PR, but I wanted to be amazing at something and realized teaching was that step for me. And I've been doing that ever since. Um, 
so I want them to understand that sometimes it can be circular, it can be confusing to figure out what type of job they want to pursue. How did, how did you go about that process, Sarah, on figuring out what you wanted to do? Yeah, that's such a great question. You know, um, it's true that when uh, when Keith and I met, we were uh, students in college and um, what you choose to do in your college career, what you choose to study and where you choose to go can open up a lot of doors for you. And we were both part of a special program at Georgetown that was a summer program. So when you're a student, you're gonna have your semesters and you're gonna take your course credits, but it's super important to take advantage of other opportunities outside the classroom, like summer programs, or even when you have breaks in your schedule, um, to do things that are not just fun or earning money, um, but to do things that can supplement your perspective. So. I also um, chose to uh, go to this summer institute at Georgetown where we um, had classes, but we also were interns in international organizations. I was an intern with Sister Cities International at that time um, that forms relationships between different cities overseas and uh, U.S. metropolitan areas. Um, but when it came time to figure out what I wanted to do, I was highly motivated by uh, my own background and personal story, as I'm sure all of you come from different places and have family histories and stories. So my parents um, actually served in East Africa, in uh, Kenya. And so I was born in a small remote village of Kenya. And um, I was born in a year of drought. And uh, when I was born, I was um, in a mission hospital. So it wasn't a big formal place and uh, the village chief and his family came. Uh, my mom had an audience at my birth and they were all there welcoming me into the world. <laughs> and when they brought me back to the village, um, all the elders and um, the community held a rain dance to welcome me home from the hospital because it was such a bad drought that they really hoped that I would be a good omen and that I would bring rain. And of course, I was a small baby and I was a little bit of a novelty as a, a white baby in a remote uh, village environment, but I didn't have the power to bring rain. I didn't have any special things to offer them, um, but that, that memory and that message, the, the hope that I would bring relief to many people and that I would be an inspiration um, really was something that stayed with me in my early life. And so when I was 15 years old, I raised money to help build a school back in that community where I was born. And I went back with a team of people and we broke ground on an elementary school um, in Kisumu, Kenya. And while we were breaking ground on uh, that elementary school, uh, Somali refugees um, from the north came and squatted on the land. So we had to stop building the school. And imagine at this time, I'm now 15 years old, um, you know, trying to um, partner with local communities and teachers and, and build this school. And all of a sudden we had to stop everything we were doing. Um, because the grounds um, that we had purchased for the school became a refugee camp. And so I became very motivated um, to help refugees and to understand the dynamics uh, when uh, foreign populations come into another country, um, what it's like. And in my book um, that Keith read that um, is Bring Rain, um, it ta I talk about how um, the Somali refugees were treated by the Kenyan uh, police and the Kenyan people, and they were very unwelcome. Uh, they were beaten with uh, baseball bats and sticks, and even the women and children uh, were put into dump trucks uh, to transport them uh, north toward the border. And I was just shocked um, that that anyone would treat another human being this way, and why were they so unwelcome? And, um, and why were they being taken to these refugee camps? And certainly I thought that there, were, uh, there had to be a better way of helping refugees than to round them up and um, put them in these enclosures. And uh, those refugee camps, uh, Dadaab Camp and Kakuma Camp in Kenya are now over 20 years old. And some people have been growing up in those camps and living in those camps for many decades. And that's just no way for human beings to live, um, to be forced to eat rations and to um, 
not be able to work or go to school, but just to sit in that camp every day uh, is no way to live. But Somalia is very dangerous as a country and has a lot of political instability. So people fear for their lives to go back. Um, and yet they're relatively unwelcome in Kenya. And Kenya has tried over time to do some different things um, to make it better for the refugee populations uh, with the help of United Nations agencies and humanitarian agencies. But these are very complex dynamics and they really motivated me in my early life uh, to try to do better for humanity. It is, it is you have such an amazing story. And one, one of the things that you just talked about that I wanted to bring up is that we are so fortunate to be living in, in the country that we are right now. And I was listening to a podcaster a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about, we all need to find our unfair advantages. Like mm -hmm. as, as a student, you guys are put into a situation where you're at a school, you don't have much control about that. Like when I was your age, I was talking to environmental ambassadors. Why was, why did Mr. Hammond get to do that? I had some control over that, but I really didn't. It was just an opportunity that was presented to me. So a lot of your life, and we are fortunate to live in the place we do in the time we are, where the internet makes so many things available to you. You're very fortunate to be living where you are. It's just a matter of, you know, if, you, if you're in this country and you have a little bit of money, in some ways that's an advantage. If you're in this country, you have a lot of money. In some ways that's an advantage. Your, I would suggest that one of your jobs now is to take in the experiences you can, take advantage of the opportunities you get, which are either fair or unfair, that you either have control over or not, and just explore them and make, make the most of them. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about that, Sarah, is that mm -hmm. you had, right out of college, you had one of the best jobs ever. You got to work for a congresswoman. How yeah. did you... How did that process go about? I'm sure there are several students here who would love to, the opportunity to work for a congresswoman at some point. Um, what was that process and you being able to get that that incredible opportunity? Yeah, thank you for asking, Keith. You know, um, I'm sure that many of you, uh, while you're students, you have different uh, challenges that come up in your life. And uh, when I was um, a student in college, there was one year that um, that my mom got sick and I wanted to go home uh, to Maine and I uh, wanted to do something while I was in Maine, but I uh, didn't uh, necessarily have the, the time to have a full time job. And so I decided to volunteer in the state office of uh, Senator Olympia Snow. And because I was a volunteer and I wanted to be there for my mom, uh, who wasn't doing well at the time, I really had fun with the office and I uh, was open minded to do whatever they needed to do, uh, whether that was answer phones or greet people or plan for events or uh, get ready for meetings. And I just had a really good time. I got to know the mayor of uh, Portland, uh, Maine, which is the largest city in Maine. And I got to know state delegates and all the local staff. And so when I finished uh, college as an undergraduate, uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to go work for the United Nations. And I thought, well, they, why wouldn't they want someone like me? I, I speak French and I have traveled a little bit. Um, but I didn't realize that um, to work for the United Nations or a large international agency, you need experience. You need more than just a volunteer trip or a few months building a school. Um, and so I quickly realized that I wasn't going to get the type of position I thought I would, but I was very lucky and I got a call one day from the Senator's office in Washington asking me if I would like to come to Washington DC and to work for the Senator. And so I had a, an interview with the Chief of Staff, but I came recommended from the State Director and from the Mayor of the city um, who really liked me because of the volunteer work I did during the summer. And um, my book actually opens with a story about a shooting in the U.S. Capitol back in 1998. It was the last shooting before this recent uh, 
situation we had at the Capitol this past January. And that was while I was working for the Senator, I was giving a tour to journalists uh, from the state and uh, the Capitol came under, um, under fire from a, a shooter that entered into the, the crypt, which is the basement of the US Capitol. And so I talk about how, what I did to help the group stay safe during that time. And really, you never know, like at that time, I made uh, a very modest $20,000 uh, a year, which is probably below minimum wage now. <laughs> um, but this was, you know, quite some years ago. And I was just taking an entry level position uh, right out of college. But I learned how the Senate operates. I learned about the relationship between states um, like my home state of Maine and the federal government and Congress. And I also learned how people advocate uh, for changes in federal policy and international relations. And um, I learned so much, even though I was quite young. And even in the book, I say, you know, I was kind of low on the totem pole, right? Fresh out of school. Um, but I made the most of every opportunity. And, um, you know, Mr. Hammond made reference to um, taking advantage of you know, the privileges we have. And a lot of it is just um, forming relationships with people, building your network of people and um, being uh, willing to get advice from people that you work with and uh, listen to them and um, stay in touch with people that you meet. And, uh, and you will find that sometimes surprising opportunities um, come your way by doing that. That is, that is amazing and so important for, our, for my, my students to hear. One of the things I often tell students is you always, even in high school, you want to, <laughs> you want to show your competence to the people around you because you never know where those people will end up. Out of my high school senior class, there are two people I know of who worked for Microsoft, myself and PR, and another gentleman who, if you had, if you had to bet $1,000 who was going to work at Microsoft, great guy. He wasn't getting any bets, but he just he changed how things went after high school. And so uh, you, always want to, you always want to kind of show your confidence. You never know whoever you talk to, where they're going to, where they're going to end up, whether it's in high school or whether you're at a Georgetown summer program. You never know where people yeah. are going to end up afterwards. One thing I never, I only heard one other speaker ever talk about, which is crucial, is um, when we're talking about networking, is there like a system you have in place? You mentioned like keeping in touch with people. That, that's a skill that's almost never taught outside of my classroom on how, how do you network and maintain a network? Do you have a system in place or, or how, do, how do you go about keeping in touch with so many, so many people, Sarah? Yeah, it's so funny. So there's a, an entire chapter of my book about uh, your support network. And I really like to emphasize that when you're developing a support network, you should have both a per personal support network and a professional support network. So I think that um, oftentimes people think about um, the professional side, but the personal support network is really important too, because sometimes you're going to have decisions you need to make in your life that are more personal in nature. And there should be people, whether they're in your family or extended family or your friends and your friend's family that you can lean on for advice and support when you have a personal issue and you should be, um, willing, I think, as you grow into your adulthood to actually ask that person in your family or your extended uh, social network, hey, would you be someone that I can reach out to, you know, as I go to college, if I have a bad day, if, if something happens and I don't want to tell my immediate family, um, can I call you, you know, and I think it's really important to have that person, like your lifeline person, whether it's a serious issue or a non-serious issue. Um, it's great to give that person a heads up, like, hey, I want you to be one of my people. 
And the worst thing they can say is no, like I, you know, I'm busy or maybe you'll ask me for money and I don't want to give you money. I don't know what it is. Maybe somebody will say no, but be willing to ask the person, hey, will you be part of my personal support network as I leave home, as I travel abroad, you know, as I enter a new job, you know, can I reach out to you? Can I give you a call? And I think it's really important to give that person a heads up so they know if they get a call from you, hey, I better take this call, you know, or you can text them or whatever you want to do, message them. But there should be somebody you can call if you're in a personal situation um, and you need help. And in the same way, your professional network should be people that you respect and that you like. And they should be people that you are willing to schedule your time with, just like, um, you know, your your teacher, Mr. Hammond, when he asked me to speak to the class, he reached out to me and gave me a schedule and was like, when are you available? When can we set up a time to talk? So with your professional network, you really need to set up a time. You need to allow a little more formality maybe than just like, hey, I'm gonna pick up and call you when I have a bad night or something. You know, um, you're gonna need to give that person like room in their calendar and respect that they're busy with many other meetings or other job responsibilities. But those people should be people that you can um, normally, you know, you would schedule a coffee or you would um, have lunch with someone. And uh, this type of thing is more difficult with COVID, um, but virtual calls, even just regular 15 minute informational uh, interviews or phone calls can be very helpful or asking someone to review your resume can be a great way um, to ap appreciate their professional advice um, and maybe take 15 minutes of their time, maybe 30 minutes of their time, but you should be very specific um, mm -hmm. that you're looking for a job or you're just looking to grow or you're looking for specific knowledge of something that they do that you might wanna do. Um, but I always tell um, people, and it's the advice is in my book too, like the do's and don'ts of networking. So one of the don'ts is like, don't give people a laundry list of a hundred things to do for you. You know, one time someone introduced me to a young woman looking for a job and she sent me a list of 20 organizations that she wanted to work with. And I thought, well, I know people in every single one, but I'm not gonna, I don't know you very well. I'm not gonna go out to 20 entities. Um, one time someone asked me for my entire Rolodex, which is like 20,000 people that I know all over the world. And I was like, nobody gets that, you know, these are all my contacts. <laughs> Um, so, but if someone says, hey, I, I'm looking at these three organizations and you've worked for maybe all of them or one or two of them, what do you think of them? Then I can give you the advantages or the disadvantages of those organizations. I could tell you who in that organization would be open to your email or your LinkedIn uh, message. LinkedIn is a great way for people to professionally network and follow the organizations that you respect, even if you don't know individual uh, professionals in that organization, uh, you can follow them on, on Twitter and Instagram, but in LinkedIn, they will often post their job announcements. Um, they'll post internships and fellowships and volunteer opportunities. So even just following the groups that you respect and seeing who's posting for them, you know, and messaging and communicating with them through comments, I think can be a nice way to just begin the relationship. I, I realize that you guys are all like 14 and 15. Um, just so you know, this is gold that Sarah is giving you, right? <laughs> this is gold that most people don't talk about, which is crucial. It, it is so important that you have a professional network and you have a personal network and also that, um, and fortunately this is becoming more accepted, you may need to have kind of like a medical network. Like there are certain things I go to for my professional people, certain, certain things that I go to personal friends with. And then sometimes when you're in really difficult parts of your life, those people will try to, will try to support you but it's okay to reach out to therapists or other professionals. Does that make sense? That there's only so much you or the people in your network can do for people. And it's on you 
to figure out your network. It's on you to figure out how can I do that. And, and one of the things that I, I really wanted to echo that Sarah said is that the wider you can make those nets, the, the better. And also, if you noticed how specific she was, if you get to talk to someone for an hour, that is amazing. Like you should be thinking in the terms of like 15 minutes, you know, 30 minutes, like what, like when I, I mean, sure. Did I know Sarah in Georgetown? Yes. That was a, a few decades ago. <laughs> so when I was talking, so we were my, a little bit younger then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So our communication, but our communication, even though we were good friends at that point, my communications tour were very, uh, very short, very specific, and very much like, very much like if you have the opportunity to, no pressure. If you can't do it, no problem. Does that make sense? Because I have, no matter what type of friendship you had someone in the past, you don't know what their present is like. And so um, if any of you are interested, there's a, um, there's a, a podcaster who I think does the best job I've ever heard at teaching networking, not in a swarmy way, not in a let me take advantage of people way, but how do I make sure that I'm staying in contact with my, my networks so that I can, I, can, um, I can dig my well before I'm thirsty so I have people who I can go to if I, if I need to. Um, just so you guys know, it's 930 right now. Uh, Sarah and I are probably going to talk for about 15 more minutes, and then what we'll do is we'll open it up for um, for some questions. If you guys have them, you can put them in the comments if you'd like. I just wanted to give you guys a warning on the time thing. If you guys had a question, you wanted to make sure we answered that that you would put them in the in the comments. Uh, I realize, Sarah, this is kind of a broad <laughs> question, which might be too too unfair. But um, <laughs> when you were talking about uh, being working in a congresswoman's office. Mm -hmm. We were talking about you were learning a lot on how do people advocate in Washington. I realize that's a five-hour lecture, but is there anything that you could help tell my students on, on how do people advocate? How do people um, approach trying to be persuasive in places like in Washington where, they, where they, we have these huge problems that we're trying to face together? Yeah, so, I mean, the United States is unique in the sense that um, we're quite a large country in terms of our land mass. And I think this is part of our economic and social and political power that we are made up of this union of states. And as we've seen during COVID, um, I keep calling this like the devolution <laughs> of American power that um, our governors are very important because they set the state rules and regulations. And our municipal leaders are also really important because they give a lot of input on um, public health as we've seen during COVID. But here in Washington, I'm, I'm on Capitol Hill and I'm on Constitution Avenue right now. And the Capitol building is like two blocks away. And I, um, I just love this city because in Washington, D.C., you have representatives from every state um, in the House and Senate. But in Washington, D.C., you also have all the embassies from all over the world. And so we really have a very interesting international community here in Washington, not only as a major city, but as a place where all the countries also try to get the attention of people in Washington. I do think that with COVID, we see the importance of um, power at the community level too. And so I don't wanna say that Washington is the end all and be all of where you need to be, but it is a very unique place for forming public policy. And it is a very special place for forming a national consensus, which we've seen over time is more and more difficult between the political parties. But it's very important. A lot of big decisions are made here about how we spend our budget. And this means that there's also a lot of lobbying of our government. There's a lot of uh, networks of trade associations, industry groups, and um, nonprofits that work on certain social issues like immigration, for example, um, that also advocate for changes in US law and US policy. 
And I certainly have focused a lot of my advocacy on populations in crisis and uh, humanitarian emergencies. Um, but there are also many other uh, issues that people advocate for, whether it's racial justice or climate change or gun violence, for example, all of which are very important uh, issues uh, for the United States and issues that the world is looking to us to continue to make uh, progress in those areas where it's evident that we still are having a lot of um, a lot of challenges in our own social cohesiveness as a nation. So how do people influence Washington? I think they band together. Um, we were talking before about the power of networks. Um, if you don't have a large group of people or the states come together, um, there's the Conference of US Mayors, um, there's the National Governors Association, um, there, are, there are networks of networks of people coming together to try to show a broad base of support for certain types of policy changes. And that is um, really important because I talk in my book about the importance of individuals and you as an individual, you have power and you have influence in your social network and in your story, where you come from and the things you've experienced, each one of you has a unique story and a unique um, sense of purpose um, that you can cultivate as you get older. But once you know what that problem is that you want to address, or once you have a vision, like let's say you don't necessarily want to focus on, on a problem, but you want to create a vision of a future if you're in the arts, um, you want to bring new things into being, you want to start a new business. Um, even then, you know, making sure you have a broad base of support, um, making sure that people share your vision of what you want to do and they buy into your vision. So like if you want to start a business, you might need a loan from a bank. Um, you might need a lawyer to help you with all the paperwork of registering your business. Um, and you might need to do market surveys of your customer base. Or if you're an artist, you need to know who's going to buy your art and where it's going to be displayed and how you're going to get on a schedule of production. So you're producing new work and, you know, and all of these things take uh, groups of people that buy into what you're doing, that believe in you, not only as a person, but believe in what your offering is because you're offering something specific um, to them, to your customer, to the public. And in my case, you know, what I'm really offering is a better peaceful world um, in that we're trying to um, have less people that are suffering. Uh, we're trying to have less conflict. And certainly uh, I've done a lot of work with refugees and trying to give them a permanent home so that they're not on the move and having to constantly cross borders, but they can settle in a place where they have safety and dignity and can work and go to school and live a normal life. So we have to understand what it is that we're offering. And some people call this like a unique selling point. You know, um, Mr. Hammond, he was in PR, but some of you might go into sales where you're selling a product or you're selling a, um, a vision really. And in the nonprofit sector, whether you're with the Red Cross or you're with the United Way, you're really selling a vision of a better society and trying to get people to buy into that idea that it's up to all of us to work toward a better society. So I think um, being part of being influential is definitely uh, bringing other people in to this vision or this product or this creation that you want to bring into the world. And um, that is a very important part of being successful. What I, what I used to say in, when I was working in public relations is I was in sales without the paycheck. And I think that we're all in, uh, I, I now wanna change that saying to, we're all in sales, just most of us aren't paid like it. So that ability to be able to sell ideas, whether it's a product or whether it's something, is something you guys are already doing all the time and something is a really good sale, uh, set of skills to be able to kind of cultivate is how do I, how am I best persuasive? How can I best come, you know, bring across? And sometimes it means talking more. Sometimes it means talking less. It's, it, it will be the rest of your lives figuring that out, but I would, I would just uh, suggest to you that's a very good skill set to to learn about and and get get good at doing. 
Um, one of the other things I want I wanted to bring up because we're coming up to uh, less than ten minutes for what I agreed with with Sarah. We would kind of speak in general. Uh, it has to do with she was talking about helping refugees. Now that's a huge problem. And one of the things that I thought was fascinating in her book was talking about doing essentially surveys. Like how do you, there's this huge problem. How do I figure out what would be most helpful to the people at the time? And Sarah, would you be able to talk to my students a little bit about how do you, these problems are huge. Can, can you help us kind of figure out how do you, how do you decide, how do you, um, what, what specifically should be working on or what would be best to do in that situation to help people? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the core aspects of being a humanitarian and doing emergency work is being able to conduct an assessment, uh, which is often a, a needs assessment or a survey. Um, but this is something that you can do in communities. And even in your class, it would be really interesting um, to do a human geography assessment of where you are now and um, to be able to survey your community. And um, you can go to school to take courses um, that really hone in on this. In my uh, background, I did my graduate studies at Oxford University in the United Kingdom, and I have a master's degree in forced migration and refugee studies. So when I was studying refugee populations at Oxford, we had entire classes on how to sample populations. So let's say there's a refugee camp of 10,000 people um, trying to determine um, how many people would be a representative sample, whether it was 1,000 or 500 or 100. And then we would segment the population. We would, uh, a lot of humanitarian agencies, they register the population. So in the United States, we have the census and we have our municipalities and our states. So anyone in the United States can um, look up the demographic data in their state and in the country and compare that to others. So we already have a baseline if you wanna do research in the social sciences. Um, in the United States, it's pretty easy, but in an emergency in many other countries, you have to kind of start from scratch. So we would take that population of 10,000 people and we would know how many men there are, how many women there are. We would know the breakdown of people by age. We would know the breakdown of people by language, um, by ethnic group also, um, as um, in many places, there are an, a numerous ethnic groups in uh, a refugee camp population. And then I would go about um, interviewing them in different ways. And when I say I, I really mean we, which is a team of people. So for example, when I worked um, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, I had a staff of 50 people who were all trained in uh, surveying the population for different indicators of need. And so uh, we would break the population up into different focus groups. So we would talk with the women separate, then we would talk with the men, we would talk with the elders separate, then we would talk to the children. Uh, we would talk to different ethnic and linguistic groups uh, separately. And we would ask them the same questions. And then we would um, analyze the differentiation in the needs between adults and children or men and women or people of different backgrounds. And this is very specific to a refugee camp context when you're trying to figure out how to meet the needs of the entire population. But when you're doing this in the United States, and I do have uh, some experience uh, working in disasters in the United States. In my book, I talk about Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. And I also uh, did some work during Superstorm Sandy in New York and New Jersey. And um, in my own communities around uh, Northern Virginia have used some of these same skills uh, for other types of needs, um, like improving telecommunications networks and uh, surveying who's using what type of cell phone technology and uh, studying the distance between um, who had good comms and who didn't. So you can use this in uh, many different contexts, but it is important to read about it, to go to school, uh, about it to use the baseline data that's available to you that other people have developed and then to come up with your own survey or your own analysis. So you could, you could actually map 
through OpenStreetMap and some other online technologies, map all the social services uh, in your zip code and uh, map who's using those social services and maybe uh, talk as a class about uh, gaps you see, whether um, it, those are environmental gaps. So for example, I've always thought one great community project anywhere in the US would be um, mapping pollution and mapping um, people that um, unfortunately are littering. Uh, we don't necessarily know who those people are, but we could uh, use open source technology and we could map the locations of litter and garbage and um, try to identify ways of keeping those places cleaner. Like, do we need to put um, public waste bins there? Do we need to put signage there not to throw your, you know, your fast food uh, cups and bags uh, in that particular park or that particular site? Um, what is it that changes people's behavior? And I think we could do a lot better at that in the United States as we look toward being more environmentally responsible. So some of these projects are well within your reach and in your school as a class. And I know some universities are also doing um, like green analysis of their university campus. So students are doing projects um, to try to determine how the university can lower their uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then they're changing the policies of the university, the type of products they use in the cafeteria, the type of recycling that they do. And in some cases, students have saved their universities uh, millions of dollars by conducting these studies as part of their coursework. So the moral of the story is if you have an interest in social change and demographic change and particular types of problems, some of the studies and research that you do, whether you're in high school or college, um, can actually really improve your community and open the eyes of people that are decision makers and maybe lead to something you know much bigger than yourself. So don't shy away from uh, trying to do those types of projects while you're in school. That's, again, amazing stuff, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing that. If my students have, uh, unfortunately, their high school career is pretty regimented on which type of classes they have to take. Mm -hmm. If they are interested in these types of things going into college, what type of classes should they be looking into to be able to pursue those types of mm -hmm. projects and, and those types of interests? Gosh, well, in... In my book, In Bring Rain, I, I say there's a lot of different paths. There isn't one set path um, to being a humanitarian or to be involved in social change. Um, certainly, you can study a number of different fields. Um, I studied international relations and uh, French and African studies because I knew I wanted to work internationally. And I, I started a lot of my work in um, in Africa and then Asia and the Middle East and other parts of the world. Um, so I think it really depends. I mean, you can study uh, sociology and um, really look at culture and society. I also teach cultural anthropology, which is a much deeper dive into uh, social identity. And uh, that's a really great uh, type of class to take in school. But you can also study business and as I said, be involved in job creation and economic development. Um, you can study public policy if you wanna be a public servant, if you want to run for office, it can be really any type of office. You know, so often we think of political people as the president or the senator or the member of Congress, but in reality, local elections and uh, school boards and uh, committees that people serve on in our cities and our states are really important mechanisms for social change um, throughout the country. So don't shy away from those opportunities to step up to leadership. Um, and I think there's so many great things um, that you can do. You could be a medical professional um, and save lives. You could study epidemiology, which is uh, the transmission and of disease. And um, that sounds like such a big word, but it's really important now with um, the different kind of public health challenges that we see not only in the US with COVID, but all over the world 
trying to reduce the spread of disease is very important. So there's so many things you can do. I think a lot of it is having the mindset of why am I doing the work that I'm doing? Like, what is it that motivates you? And tapping into that motivation and going with it. Like I said, you can be a creative person and produce art or produce video. Um, I mentioned a gentleman in my book who is a, a gamer who produces um, video games for social change. And he was a former refugee in that same camp where I started uh, working in 1992. And he was from Somalia and he was forced to live in that camp until he was resettled in the United States and he started studying computer science and technology. And now he's developing award-winning games um, that help um, people like us understand what it means uh, to live through a war or a crisis and to find a path to peace. So these types of things are just super inspiring and so wonderful. So, you know, the world is your oyster at this stage to identify what you want to do and how you want to get there. And I think it's really important to also say that um, even though you have great opportunities, not to get deterred by hiccups or obstacles in your path. And in my book, Bring Rain, I also talk about obstacles and uh, things that have happened to me that are less than pretty stories about um, you know, being in a car accident, being held hostage, um, having difficulties in my family life when I was younger. And I think that these difficulties are something um, that we have to uh, go through in our life and to remember that when you do go through difficulties that there is an other side of it and um, not to get lost in, in the moment, but to realize that over the course of your lifetime, you're gonna go through different phases and stages of life. And at every phase, you are going to need those people around you who can speak truth to you and um, honor you and be part of your journey. Um, so I just would encourage you not to look inward uh, when you do have a moment that isn't so bright. Um, look around you, use your support network and and work through it and, and move forward. You know, I like to say I haven't uh, gotten every job that I've applied for and I haven't won every opportunity that I tried to get. But ultimately, um, you look back and you see, wow, the things you're able to do when you put yourself out there is pretty cool. So that is that is that is incredible. I um I want to I know you're so busy, Sarah. Thank you so much for spending some time with my students. Uh, do you have uh, about 10 more minutes or do you need to do you need to sign off at this point? I'm great. I'm happy to take questions. If anybody has questions, I know that um, Mr. Hammond gave you the link to my website where you can read the first 20 pages of the book. It's also on Amazon. If you're, if you read on Kindle or electronically, I think the Kindle version is like $7.99 um, cheaper than buying the paper book. But if you are interested in reading the book or if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn uh, or message me there, if you have other questions, I'm happy um, to try to answer your questions. You can also follow me on Instagram and at Sarah Petrin, uh, P-E-T-R-I-N. But I'm happy to take a few questions now also. All right. Uh, if any of my students have any questions, you can either put it in comments if you feel comfortable or sure. at this point you can just... Um, go go through it um milana do you are you able to unmute yourself so you could ask the question directly <laughs> yeah hi can you hear me yes thank you hi, hi um, thank you for like speaking with us you're so inspiring um my question was just kind of like you know as an experienced advocate and humanitarian what advice would you personally have to young leaders who may feel like overwhelmed about all the issues facing the world and how to go about addressing them yeah, thank you. It can be overwhelming if you look at everything all together and especially all the things that have happened in the last year or two uh, with the racial injustice that we've seen and uh, the just the, fra the fracturing in American society, right? Um, politically speaking, on top of COVID, on top of political infighting, um, on top of, you know, all the challenges going on in the world from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that uh, just got 
you know, broader Rekindled, yeah. gun violence and mass shootings. That's a lot, right? So I think it's really important to recognize that as one individual that you do have to choose a path and you really have to ask yourself some key questions. And I think I have five questions in my book about, you know, what motivates you um, to do to do something in the world? You know, what is the catalyst that is inspiring you? Is it something um, from within yourself, maybe from your own story, or your family or the, your experience growing up? Or is it coming from the news and what you're reading um, or seeing in the news or what you're following on social media? Like, what is it that grabs you? And sometimes people say, what is it that bothers you? You know, what kind of problem do you want to change? But like I said, it's also about what you want to create, what you want to project into the future, maybe a, a, a creation or a business or something new that you want to bring that you think, gosh, the world could use this or my community could use that. Or I would love to see this type of product or that type of um, opportunity out there in society. So I don't want to say that um, you have to just get a job. Like nowadays you can create a job or create a company or an opportunity. Um, it's not easy to do that. It's, it's tricky, but you really have to ask yourself, what is motivating me? What do, what do I think that I want to bring to the world um, that I wish was different than what I see right now in the world? And if you can answer that question, the next question is, you know, what unique skills or what unique um, traits do I bring to addressing this? And one of those will have to be your education. Uh, one of those will have to be what you choose to study, um, whether you go to a trade school or a vocational school, or whether you get a certificate for a certain type of technical skill, or whether you go to a full college and then on to graduate school, or whether you get a PhD and become an academic. It really, your education has to be part of your choice for how you want to grow professionally over time. So I think that um, those two questions are a good place to start. And there are some other questions in my book also that you can reflect on that will help you kind of choose a path. Um, but you have to know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, there's wonderful opportunities to serve others, to volunteer, to travel, um, to get to know yourself as an independent adult as you grow older. Um, and that can only help you to, um, to succeed in the future. So don't be afraid to explore. Maybe you're saying, gosh, I don't know any of the answers to these questions. Um, but explore your community, explore these questions with the books you read and the friends you make. Um, and the community organizations you can serve and support while you're a student and um, and figure it out over time. You know, I've, I've had the benefit of, you know, a few decades of working uh, in order to write this book and give this advice. So, you know, you'll have to also get that experience to find your own unique path. If I could just add to what Sarah said, I think one of the things that I had trouble with when I was your guys' age right now was just how complex the world is. You know, when I look at like my, there's a reason I get paid. I, I get paid to take all of these really difficult, complex problems. And the world is much more complex than what I teach you. I'm trying to teach you the basis. And the analogy I use for like, kind of for my faith journey, but I think is really true for the world in general is we've all seen a rug. And when we see a rug from the outside, we see kind of like this beautiful pattern. And the thing is, is if you, I remember being little, the first time I flipped over a rug. If you flip over a rug, you've got this beautiful pattern on the outside. But if you look underneath, it is a mess. You would never know looking at the back of a rug, like what's on the other side of it. And so um, especially, especially living in the society we do today, like capitalism is the back of a rug. Can it create an amazingly powerful economic country? Yes, but capitalism is a very 
complex, moving parts, difficult sometimes to navigate system to be to kind of find your way in. And so what I would I, I would just echo what what Sarah had to say about kind of finding out, okay, out of all of this that's happening, what am I interested in? And all of this that is happening in this huge story that's being told, what's you know, where am I? Where was I placed in this story? And then who can I help? <laughs> who can I help? What can I do to make my piece? And just like the rug is messy, you it's funny, in your life, you won't know the things that you go through that will have an impact later on, that will have an impact decades down, down the line. And so, um, so the key is just stepping forward. Is stepping forward, asking your questions of where am I, and what what are the next steps? Uh, do we have anybody else who would like to ask a, a last question before I uh, before we go ahead and and stop this, this time? I've got a few of you I need to talk to afterwards, so um, I needed to leave time for that. Any la any last questions? All right. Well, uh, Sarah has done an amazing job and has been very generous. Uh, she's mentioned that uh, she has an Instagram if you'd like to contact her. Don't ask for her Rolodex. Don't ask for that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you'd like to contact her, um, just so you know, LinkedIn would be a good, just so you know, out of those two, she's, she's let you know how to contact her. From a professional standpoint, LinkedIn would be a good way to go. If you have kind of like more of a bookish type question or more kind of a lighter question, Instagram is a good way to go. And you guys probably know that better than me of how the different flavors of social media are for different purposes.